Marx is deeply indebted to Hegel's progressivist view of history. For Marx, as for Hegel, world history has a rational orientation towards freedom. But Marx wants to do away with the Hegelian talk of spirit and the idea. For Marx, what shapes history are the material conditions themselves. So Marx is known as a dialectical materialist because he holds on to the structure of dialectic that we discussed in Hegel, but he says that this dialectic is itself material and it happens through material conditions rather than being about a relation between material conditions and spirit. Today we're talking about alienation and private property. Marx draws his famous notion of alienation in part from Hegel's notion of the self-estrangement of spirit, which I mentioned in the last video. Recall that spirit has to externalize itself in order to relate to itself and have its spirit reflected back to it. Well, Marx agrees with Hegel that this is a fundamental structure of self-consciousness, but he says that it is perverted under certain material conditions. And the material conditions that he's focused on here are those of capitalism. Let's first talk about self-estrangement that is non-alienated. Well, Marx says that humans are essentially practical, active beings, homo faber in Latin. We're always seeking to create. We're always building worlds. And we do so according to rational laws, right? We use our reason to create beautiful, productive things in the world. Now, let's say, for instance, that I do that by creating a vase. If I'm creating a vase, I have something in mind that I want to be able to use and enjoy. So. I'm already geared towards that vase creation with a rational plan. Mark says, this is something that humans just tend to do. So I say, okay, I've got some raw materials, I've got some clay, and I've got some paint, and I can form this vase into the shape that I want and a shape that I think would be useful for me. And then I can decorate it as I wish. And once I have created this vase, it is separate from me, right? It's no longer an idea in my head, but it's an actual thing out there in the world. And this is so affirming. It feels so good, Marx says, because what I am doing when I see the vase as separate from me, when I put flowers in the vase, when I look at the vase on my shelf, I am affirming my very human nature as a creative, active being. What happens under the conditions of capitalism for Marx is that the laborer gets separated from the product of their labor. So it's no longer enough for me to just use and enjoy the vase myself. I actually have to sell the vase to somebody else. And although this is kind of a long and complicated process that Marx details not only in this work, but in other works, the basic idea is that part of the reason I have to sell it is because usually I don't even own the raw materials anymore. Laborers under capitalism don't have access to the means of production. I don't have access to the clay that I need, to the paint that I need, and probably to maybe like I need a kiln as well, right? So I have to use somebody else's means of production. For Marx, there's a separation under capitalism between the laborers and the owners of the means of production, or the capitalists. As a laborer, I have to sell my labor to a capitalist, and what I usually get in return for that is not the actual thing that I create. The vase doesn't go to me. The vase goes to the capitalist. And what do I receive in exchange for my labor power? Well, I receive wages. And one of the problems with wages for Marx is that they can't give me the kind of satisfaction or affirmation in my human nature as a productive being in the way that an actual product of my labor can. So on page 75, for instance, Marx says that the worker doesn't find a reflection of their own capacities in the object that they create. The object of my labor is not only not something that I usually get to take home if I'm a laborer, but it actually transforms in its character. It becomes a commodity. Let's talk a little bit about the kinds of value that Marx sees in objects and how they pertain to capitalism. For Marx, there are three primary forms of value, use value, exchange value, and surplus value. I've talked about the vase as being something that I can put flowers in and enjoy the look of from an aesthetic perspective. 
those refer to the use value of my object. If you think about shoes, for instance, right? The use value of your shoes is that they protect your feet as you walk down the street. But there is a second kind of value that a lot of economic systems utilize, not just capitalism, although capitalism is one of them, and that is exchange value. The exchange value of this vase is how much I can sell it for on the market, right? And so I try and get, let's say, $30 for this vase, because I say, well, you know, the clay costs $2 and the paint costs $3. And then I put two hours of work into it. And so I'm going to sort of add that up and let it be $30. And whether or not that's a fair price is determined by the laws of supply and demand on the market. Does this price seem comparable to that of other vases that are the same size and um, skill level, etc.? The third kind of value surplus value is really where capitalism gets going. Surplus value is how much more I can get for the vase beyond the sum of its labor cost and material cost. If I can sell the vase for $35, then I get to go home with that $5 in my pocket and I've more than broken even. But of course, the way I've just described it presumes that I, as a laborer, am the one who's getting the surplus value. That's not how things work. Marx says that surplus value gets off the ground through laborers selling their labor power to capitalists. Basically, if I own a vase factory, I'm a capitalist, I can say, okay, I'm gonna buy in bulk all of this clay, all of this paint, I have the kilns, and I'm gonna hire a bunch of workers. How do I decide how much to pay my workers? Well, I decide based on what Marx calls average labor power. Let's say that the average person is able to create half a vase in an hour. Well, I'm going to then calculate how much I'm gonna pay them based on the price of half a vase minus the material costs, which include also the cost of wear, say, on the kiln, right? You can only use a kiln so many times. But when I actually go to sell the vase on the market, I'm not just going to sell it according to how much it costs to pay the worker plus the cost of materials. I'm also gonna add a little bit extra, and that's gonna be my surplus value. Capitalism functions through the accumulation of wealth, which is only possible if you have a surplus value to goods. But the surplus value of goods is only possible if you pay laborers a little bit less than however much they're worth, frankly. Because the surplus value can't come out of the material costs, right? Clay costs however much clay is gonna cost and paint costs however much paint is gonna cost. But labor is a changeable commodity. It's fluid. It's determined by how much capitalists are willing to give laborers. And so you can already see here that for Marx, capitalism is not a value neutral system because it's possible only through the exploitation of laborers. Now, what does this mean for the laborer? Well, for Marx, it means that the laborer becomes alienated and alienation is psychologically a very painful thing. He lays out some of the basic ideas of alienation on page 58. The first is that the worker themselves sinks to the level of a commodity. The worker gets paid for working, right? They don't get paid for a product within the economy of exchange. They are paid for their labor power. And that means that all the worker is good for is their ability to do work. In the same way that all this vase is good for is my ability to use it and enjoy it. And Marx says that the labor is actually the most miserable commodity. What's worse, the misery of the worker is proportional to the power and volume of their production. So the more I externalize myself through products that are alienated from me because all I get in return for them are paltry wages and I never actually am able to enjoy the vase that I make, the more miserable I've become because I am putting my human essence, my being as a creative, productive individual into the object, but I don't get anything of equal value in return. And so the more I give, the more I am exploited. Marx also says that the competition among capitalists, say to turn out better and more products at cheaper and cheaper prices, 
leads to the accumulation of capital in just a few hands. So as larger companies are able to create better and more products at cheaper prices, they end up, say, buying out smaller companies. And this means that capitalism ultimately gets ruled by a small number of giant corporations. A little applicable to the present day, you might think. And finally, still on page 58, he says that society ends up getting divided into two classes, the proprietors or the capitalists and the workers or the laborers. And this increasing divide between the two classes, as we'll see, especially when we get to the Communist Manifesto, is what for Marx creates the kind of thesis antithesis structure that will ultimately lead to the collapse of capitalism and to the establishment of a new system communism. Marx outlines in this text four kinds of alienation, which I'm not going to go through in detail here, but I just want to flag because it's essential to this reading and I really want to talk about it in class discussion. First is the alienation in the object. So the more I externalize my spirit into the vase, but don't get it back in return, the less valuable I become, right? The more kind of used up as a commodity I become, the more dissatisfied I become. The second is alienation in the process, right? The process of production creates a state of misery in the worker because the worker is reduced only to their status as worker. The full spectrum of their humanity is completely irrelevant within the context of the working process. They're forced to be a kind of productive, efficient machine. This leads to the weird phenomenon that Marx describes on page 62, where the worker actually feels most themselves only outside of work. And this is a weird phenomenon for Marx because work is an essential expression of human nature. And so if we're not feeling at ease and happy and affirmed within work, that's a signal that something is wrong. The third kind of alienation Marx details is alienation from species being. As we've said, for Marx, the human species is a species of world builders. We love to create and produce. But capitalist structures of labor alienate us from this because we just start to use work as a means of supporting ourselves in our basic functions. So if you are forced to work for a wage in order to survive, according to Marx, that means that you are not living up to your potential as a member of the species of world builders. What sets us apart from non-human animals for Marx is precisely our ability to create beautiful and useful things according to laws of reason. However, when we lack a true relationship with the products of our labor, we just use our labor as a way to support ourselves in our basic functions, right? We need to have a roof over our heads, we need to eat, etc. We in fact become inferior to non-human animals because we are sort of extorting ourselves just to survive in our basic animal functions. The fourth kind of alienation is alienation from human to human. By creating a separation between the capitalist class and the worker class, we become pitted against each other as groups. We start to have a division between humans. In addition to that, even within a particular class, if you think about the capitalist class, according to Marx, they're all in competition with each other. And so members of the capitalist class are alienated from each other because they're just each other's rivals. On the worker's side of things, you have a similar phenomenon. The fellow worker is the person for whom I am competing to get a job. Now let's talk about private property. For Marx, private property is the result of alienated labor. So by private property, Marx isn't just talking about something like this vase that I created for myself and I get to enjoy, right? He's talking about a specific form of ownership whereby this is mine and you can't have it. And I probably haven't produced it myself. He says that private property is the exclusion of somebody else's use of a commodity as their own because it belongs to me. He associates the structure of private property with wages where I get my money for doing certain tasks, and that's it. For Marx, the structure of private property indicates that human relations have become mediated through commodities. We need to have things, right? And we need to have things not as 
objects and their full spectrum of existence, but as commodities, right? Things with exchange value. My sneakers are special to me, not because they help me to get around the city, but because I saved up for them and they're this cool brand and I can post them on my Instagram. Private property, Mark says, reduces our relations to objects to a single kind, that of having. I love the vase when I'm alienated from it because I have it, right? <laughs> this is like the Lord of the Rings, my precious type of experience. All of the physical and spiritual senses under capitalism says have been reduced to a single sense, the sense of having. So we desire to consume because we have so little means outside of consumption for affirming ourselves, for feeling alive. You might think here about the art world and its commodification, the way that a painting under capitalism is most valuable for how much it gets sold at auction rather than for the feelings it creates among its viewers. When you go to a museum, you might not even know how to relate to that painting. And so what do you do? You try and have it, possess it, say by taking a photograph of it or taking a mental image and saying, oh yes, I had that experience of the painting. That is a classic case for Marx of the way that our physical and spiritual senses have been reduced. We wanna have things and when we can't have things, we wanna have experiences. We treat everything as a commodity for consumption. Now, this all sounds pretty gloomy, right? And it also sounds like capitalists are just like evil people and we need to overthrow them because they're ruining everything. And that's not the whole story for Marx. Marx actually says on page 74 that there's a necessity to this logic. Capitalism arose as an expression of human existence. And for Marx, it will also fall away as an expression of human existence. Very similar to Hegel's idea of the way that certain formations come into being for a time and then pass away through an internal logic. For Marx, it's the very structure of capitalism, especially the way that it pits labor against capitalists that leads to a tension that ultimately will become so untenable that capitalism as a structure will just sort of fall away, right? There will be a revolution in the literal sense of revolution where it's a revolving or a turning. So things no longer look at all the way they did before. Marx says that the opposition between laborer and capitalist that exists under the capitalist conditions of private property leads to a contradiction. On the side of the labor, there is all give, give, give. And on the side of the capitalist, there is all take, take, take. But people can only give so much and people can only take so much. And so the structure gets resolved or negated through an Aufhebung, remember that term from Hegel, through communism. Communism, Marx says on page 69, is the positive expression of private property as overcome. And the word he uses there for overcome is aufgehoben, right? Overcoming through both negating and preserving. But communism just doesn't sort of magically appear. It first has to go through this weird stage that Marx calls here crude communism on page 69. In crude communism, the logic of capitalism reaches its apotheosis. We go from having a division between a class of givers and a class of takers to creating the conditions for all people to be takers. Communism first appears, Marx says, as universal private property with physical possession as its aim. And the logic of capitalism that benefited only certain people gets extended to all people. The irony is that not everybody benefits in this situation. It actually creates intense dissatisfaction because Physical possession, of course, is not the ultimate goal of life for Marx. And so crude communism, Marx says, still remains captive to and infected by the logic of private property on page 71. This crude communism will ultimately give way to a truer form of communism, where the objectification of human spirit into things and the subjective affirmation, fulfillment, full spectrum of senses beyond the sheer sense of having will be united and liberated. So communism, according to Marx, wouldn't just mean a different economic system. 
it would actually mean a different psychology. Humans would have a much broader spectrum of senses. The senses will be humanized. We will be able to enjoy the arts again. Finally, Marx says on page 78 and 79 that communism for him is the next stage of humanity in denying the private property that is characteristic of capitalism. But he avows that it actually can be considered only one stage rather than an end goal because history is always in the process of becoming and we can't imagine what will come after the next stage.